Hey guys, so back in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, I had this great conversation with a bunch of really hardcore um, Jackson, Phil Collin guitar collectors, and we never posted the video. Um, it was, must have been like the COVID brain fog or something, but we finally got around to editing this thing down. We wanted to share it with you, and I watched the whole thing, and it's really cool. There's some really awesome things I've never seen before, um, so I was really shocked. You'll see when I'm seeing this stuff. Um, but that being said, I want to tell you a little bit about like who's on the call and stuff like that. So. In the beginning, when I started looking into all these cool guitars, it always led me to one person, this guy Brooks Burton. He's really well known within the Jackson guitar community because he had all those early PC arch tops. He had painted guitars, graphic guitars, um, and he and I became friends and I actually ended up taking over the PC1 fan page Facebook page um, on his behalf. Um, and then along the way, I met some other friends. So my friend Suff, who's on this um, call as well, he and I did these awesome interviews with Phil Collin and Vivian Campbell during the pandemic when everyone was stuck at home. And you know, Def Leppard shared it on their socials and put it on their official YouTube channel. That was really fun. And we made it all about the gear, um, which is really special. So I'll post all those links below. Um, and then the other guy in the call, Victor, Victor's also really entwined in the Duff Leopard community. And he's had some awesome stories to tell. He's had his hands on some amazing guitars. And it's just a great group of people who I became friends with over the years, who are really into Leopard, really into these guitars and the history of these guitars. Um, if you stay to the end of the video, there's a little bit like a, there's like an end credit scene, like in the Chippy Multiverse. I added an end credit scene. Just a fun little experience I had last last summer, I think. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoy it. There's some really cool things I've never seen, um, which I'm excited for you guys to see. Thank you all for your support of the PC1 page, of my Instagram, of everything else I do. I just love all this stuff, and I'm just always so excited to share it with everyone. All right, enjoy. Um, so today is kind of the first, I guess, PC one summit that I've done. And what we've done is kind of grabbed some of the most prominent collectors, um, in the community and grab them all together. Obviously we're, we're all friends, so it's, it's going to be fun. So we have Suff and Brooks Burton and Victor. And I think what we're going to do today is really talk about, you know, when we started becoming fans of the band and then when we started to really get deep into the collecting aspect and, you know, the, the way, you know, I wanted to share is that basically when I started out, I would Google photos of PC ones and I would find pictures, which would lead me to Brooks Burton. And I was like, who is this guy? I'm like, he's got more guitars than Phil Collin. And it like, and as I said, it's like, it wasn't a jealousy thing. It was more of just like, I was just, I it was just so mythical status for me. So that led me to the PC one page and becoming friends with Brooks. Cause I was so curious. I was like, how do you get these guitars? Like, where do you get this adrenalized? Like, how do you do it? And then we became friends and, you know, um, started managing the PC one page. So, I mean, stuff and Victor, it's very similar. I mean, you guys, you guys kind of, we all gravitated together into orbit and, uh, which I think is really cool. So, um, yeah, I just want to kind of go across the room and talk about it. So stuff, let's talk about you, for example. All right. Let's, 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 let's talk about your relationship with, 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 with loving the band and then how you got into the guitars aspect of it. Well, to, to be very uh, short and to the point, when I, I was 10 when I first heard of Def Leppard, and I went completely ballistic when I saw them. It was, I, you know, my parents left me on my own in the house one night. They do that in the 80s. And they went off to some party. I woke up, turned on the TV, on MTV, and I saw a photograph. I didn't know what I was looking at. I was like, I don't know what this is, I have no, but I want that. I want to be this. I want to do this. That's what I was at, like a 10-year-old. I got the first album, Pyromania, and that's where it all started for me. But then at some point in the late 90s, similar to your storyline, um, Alex, one of my friends saying, oh, so you like guitars. Why don't you go and get a Phil Collins guitar? I'm, I'm sure there's a signature model. I'm like Signature model? They do that? I'm like, yeah. Of course, Kirk Hammett has his own one, David Gilmore, possibly, and all, all these famous guys, they definitely have a signature model. I call them a signature model, and bang, all I get is Brooks Guitar Wall. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> Look at that, and I'm like, oh my God, he, ha he has that white guitar from Love Bites. Can you buy that? And they're like, hello, my name is Seth. I'm not crazy. I just want to know if you have, where do you get these guitars from? <laughs> And that's really, I think it was 99. I think it was 99, the year 99, when I emailed Brooke for, Brooks first. Mm -hmm. So kudos to you, Brooks. Definitely. Yeah. You got me into 
collecting these bloody things. And it's a very bad habit. <laughs> it's very <laughs> expensive a habit. habit. Oh, God, yeah, it's very expensive. But it is absolutely a pleasure. And I'm really happy. Uh, definitely awesome. give you kudos to that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Victor, let's, uh, let's start with you uh, next. Um, so did you start collecting because of Brooks as well? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm going to credit to my... I'm uh, creeping up on 50 next year, so my music goes back to even even further. So I remember literally 79, 80, 81, high and dry, whatnot, and I, I was absolutely blown away by it. And and as a kid, I would plunk away on some shitty old acoustic and be- bother my parents for an electric, and that was just never going to happen and whatnot. But uh, it was really, you know, when the Hysteria cassette came out, I remember that. It just... It just literally knocked me back. I remember to this day, the final track of Love and Affection and like, I was just taken off my then Sony walk and going, wow, like I'll, I'll, I'll spare the uh, expletives, but wow, it just transformed everything. That album was and is to this day, the, the one and only, you know, the Desert Island pick. And uh, I said, okay, that's it. I'm getting an electric. And I got some ratty old electric I think I literally plugged it to my parents' old Radio Shack amp at that point. And so it snowballed from there. And then I started seeing, obviously, pictures and like, okay, it's Jackson, it's Charvel, it's whatnot. So I, I did gravitate towards them. And this is even pre-PC1 because they didn't really come out till what, 90, 96? Six, yeah. Yeah. So I'd seen them in 91 or 92 during the, the Adrenalize tour. And at that point, Phil was using a whole lot of Charvels and Jacksons that Stan had put together and whatnot. So that was in that direction. And then I also stumbled across Brooks on the Jackson form and whatnot. And then it sort of snowballed from there. And, uh, and, and here we go. And then, you know, as my wife says, here we are. And rolls her eyes. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to step through. I think everyone's going to show kind of some of their favorites, uh, in a bit. Um, it kind of reminds me of the old JCF online, which is probably where I found some of the photos of this stuff. So Brooks, you, you know, you obviously yeah. kind of the center of gravity with a lot of the collectors and, um, you know, definitely the reason why I started getting, you know, obsessed. Um, so what about your kind of story? I mean, when did you like really get into the band and collecting and stuff? Yeah. So for me, it was definitely the love bites guitar and the love bites video. Um, it was cool because it was, it was an arts top. It had, it had a contour to it. It was, it was awesome. And, you know, mid nineties, kind of after the hysteria album came out, started Googling it, trying to find information. Uh, back then it was AOL. God, I don't know, 2.0, 1.0, uh, dial up. When somebody in your house picks up their phone, they disconnect you. And <laughs> it was just, the resources were very, I'm going to just say they weren't there. So, you know, I did a lot of research, called Jackson. I was on the phone with Sandy at Jackson, actually, with a lot of this stuff. Um, she helped me actually acquire the 96 Adrenalized guitar that I have, that I still have today. Um, but it was a whole lot. There wasn't a lot out there. So what I started to do was try and compile as much as I could in the mid-90s. Um, Brooks Guitar World came out in 99. I had started a website called Colin Guitar World in the mid-90s that had a lot of the arch tops. Um, that was up for maybe a year, year and a half, if I remember correctly. And then management, um, ja- between Jackson and Leopard Management actually asked me to shut the site down because they said I was, impersonate- I was impersonating Phil because the website name was Colin Guitar World oh. and it was all Phil Colin pictures and guitars. But all I was trying to do was make it easier for people to get information on the guitars that took me like a year to get. And I was trying to get it out to the fans. So then I went to Brooks Guitar World. They finally left me alone after that. And then I started obviously, you know, adding more of the arch tops and PC ones and things like that. But it was really the Love Bites guitar that started it for me. So that, that's that's how I got started. You know, going back to um, that ad in Guitar World for me, which had the Adrenalize in it, um, I didn't really understand, like, who painted these things. Like, even now today, people will ask me, like, well, how do you get that? And and honestly, it's a rookie question now, but it wasn't a rookie question for me. And I, when people ask it, I, I feel for them because they, they don't understand, like, how do you get these custom painted guitars? I thought that was like a concept car, like something you see in an ad that doesn't actually exist for act normal human beings. Like, I thought it was just like, a, you know, one of those things you see in a magazine you never see for real. Um, And 
you know, I guess people don't necessarily know, but I guess Dan Lawrence has done most of the Jackson graphic guitars um, that we own, right? I mean, Brooks, do you own any graphics guitars that was not a Dan Lawrence? Uh, no. The one I have is the only one I have right now is Dan with the uh, Arch Top and the Adrenalize. Those are both Dan's. So I ordered my first guitar was a PC one was an Adrenalize PC one, not this one. It actually had the Fender headstock, and I didn't know that you could just like send Dan Lawrence a guitar and he'll paint it. I thought I thought you had to do it through Jackson. So I waited two years to get that guitar, and it was so tough waiting for it. And Jackson was like so apologetic that they sent me like a jacket and a keychain and like patches because that's cause, nice we should we should do try that but we now try that. Yeah, we should all try it. <laughs> but now two years is like two years is now expected like when i send a guitar to dan like you know like nine ten months in he'll be like okay i'm gonna look at your guitar now i'm like all right cool good thing i sent it 10 months ago he's gonna hate me now because i put it on video but <laughs> i mean ask but, him for progress picks he loves that <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know what it is? I think you get, you know, I think it's worth it in the end. And I think there's something nice about waiting for it. Because when I got the hysteria, I, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing. And it was such a, it's an amazing thing. I think if you got it in three weeks, you'd be like, eh, whatever. <laughs> you know, there's, there's something about it. Um, so, you know, Victor, you talked about Love and Affection. That was the one of the only songs that for some reason, because it was at the end of the album, I just didn't consider actually part of hysteria. It's this weird quirk. And I don't, I don't know why I just, I just, the songs were so good throughout the whole album that by the time I got to love infection, I probably just like started over. But it, it, it was meant to be their eighth single. And it, they didn't release it because they were like, ah, it'd be a joke if we release an eighth single. So they didn't. It's funny. Apparently. All right. So let's, let's talk about, you know, guitars that are special to you. Um, so if I think you you had um, shown Kermit um, in in the in the movie in the video with Phil, um, yes. and you know I remarked you know how I didn't have a Kermit, and I feel really left out. That is so nice. Actually, the the reason why I got Kermit is um, seeing Phil play. Well, I was in '99, back again in '99. They were playing Dublin at the Olympia Theatre. And I bumped into Phil then, and I was talking to him, and he told me, I have great guitar, la, la, la. It's a green one. I was like, okay, I don't know what's so special about a green guitar. But then in the concert when he's playing it, he was playing Kermit. But then he changed it to another Kermit. I was like, that can't be. There's two of them. So basically he had Kermit, and he had Kermit Jr. And what I thought it would be a good idea is, because I really fell in love with the guitar when I saw it you know, live, I want to get a different copy, not to get like a Kermit or a Kermit Jr., kind of combination of the two. So Kermit has a mahogany body, green top, and a flamed maple, or sorry, quilted maple neck. Junior has a green back, as an all painted all green, and a rosewood neck. Oh, so, interesting. So I did kind of combination. I took Junior, Kermit Jr.'s neck and I placed it on a Kermit 1 or a Kermit body. That's basically what it came to be. That's a beauty. Phil, and I showed it to Phil in 2002 when they were rehearsing uh, for the X tour. He thought it was very heavy. Oh, interesting. He's like, oh, that's a lot of paint. He thought, that's a lot of paint. It's very heavy. <laughs> I love <laughs> how we can tell that. That's what he was like. Oh, it's cool. It's, it's Kermit. It's like, yeah, I'm like, eh, fantastic. I have two. I was like, I know. So I made the third one. <laughs> that's awesome. Brooks, you have... Um... Yeah, quite the collection. I mean, you came over to my house and we merged like it was like Voltron. It was like the PC one Voltron <laughs> merging. Um, oh, and uh, I was just always blown away by the number of PC ones. So did you did you get those in a very compressed time period or did you get them like spaced out? Like where did those things come from? Uh, everything was over the years. Um, one of the real uh, milestones for me was Grover Jackson had given slash sold guitars to a certain collector out there that back in the 90s, he ended up selling his entire collection. And at the time, he had sold two prototypes, archtop prototypes. One was the gunmetal string through and one was a one, no, it was one hum, one single number 53 uh, with a Kaler, flat mount. 
and I acquired those guitars, and that's kind of what started me uh, getting more and more over time, starting out with two arch tops. Uh, then I had one from GMW that I bought from them that was an adrenalized arch top, uh, just with a graphic on a Japan model. And then just over time, I was going to NAMM shows, and I find out, hey, they made an Ash run, so let me get an Ash, uh, one of the Ash NAMM display guitars. Uh, and it just kind of escalated there I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. I'm going to ask you, Brooks, if for the arch tops, if you don't mind me jumping in, Alex. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, just for the arch tops, Brooks. Yeah. They, they have a particular fan base. Not everybody is a fan of the arch tops. Yeah. You have to be kind of like, like you said, really into Leopard in the 80s to appreciate mm -hmm. the arch tops. And if you remember as well, all the videos of, nearly all the videos from the Adrenalize um, era, they all had the arch tops in them. Except for mm -hmm. in, uh, what you call that um, one particular video, no problem. But they all had an arch top in them, so that's when Phil was promoting the arch top guitar. It was in really in from '94, I think, when they came out '94, '95, if I remember. So there was a period where the arch tops and the PC one existed. You can order both of them from Jackson. Yeah, was that correct? Yeah, the the arch tops went up to. I, I was running that arch top. Uh, Facebook page. And I remember we were getting serial numbers up into the 70s, 80s, and then we went to some special orders. Uh, but those numbers were coming in in the 91, 1992, 93, some 95s, but then the PC1 really started in 96, but you could still order that PC1 arch top. You know, it's, guys, it's kind of a funny story, but I, I didn't have MTV growing up. Which is, I know seems shocking to you, but my parents were like, shocking. my parents, my parents to this day still don't have cable. You know, they're just, they're like public access TV people. And um, I, I didn't, the arch top didn't resonate with me because I, I don't think I even saw the videos. You know, I, I remember my first, <laughs> my first, uh, I guess when I saw the videos was like at my neighbor's house, I would see Let's Get Rocked and stuff like that, you know. Um, so when, when I never hunted this guitar because it just wasn't my era, I guess. It was always the Adrenalize on. And um they came out with a very, very limited run. I don't remember. This is the JCF on online days. Do you guys remember that forum? Yeah, I picked yeah. up one of those guitars. That yeah, was my – that was like one of the forums yeah. I first started on. It was the – I love that place. It was great. Um, it was before forums got negative, like before people started losing their minds. Like it was a really cool place. Um, but Matt's Music did a run of these. I think they were 12. It was very 26, low. 26 in total. There were 26? 26. Oh, I thought it was much they less. One. They, the initial numbers were something 12 to 14. Um, and then it ended up being more, definitely more than that. A solid two dozen, it, it came out like that. So Wow. Yeah. So th this one, what's interesting about it, which is pretty cool, was that it has the PC uh, sustainer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which the originals didn't have. Um, and I think they had to make some changes. I forgot who told us this stuff. Someone told us this, but they had to make some changes to the body to fit the sustainer well, and stuff like that. One of the things, not to cut you off, one yeah. of the things they refused to do was they wouldn't round over the headstock like Phil's. Um, Matt had tried that, and that was a bit of a deal breaker for some guys. At that point, I said, fine, I'll grab one. But you know how the Phil's would round over the tip? Uh, they wouldn't do that, and there was a oh. few other small details. So it wasn't exactly where we'd like it but overall it was a fantastic guitar fantastic so only you would know this this is why we have you on on the call right um brooks knows that <laughs> so the yeah, but, but, but I, to ask brooks brooks i know okay so you are really would be the ultimate i suppose arch top guru so from your point of view knowing all the runs that have been there the kind of the the yellow red and the limited colored one i think they're 30 yeah, they're nice. made 10 10 10 they're okay no, I wasn't particularly a fan of them. And then the ones that Alex is holding. But prior to that, so in your opinion, mm -hmm. in the expert opinion, what would be the top four rare or unique arch stops to have? And I know that you have a secret arch stop that you haven't told anyone about. That's right. I have one that I picked up two years ago that everybody, a lot of people saw it, but they didn't realize I was the guy that bought it. Um, but one of the, uh, I'll just turn the camera on here. One of the most, rare ones that i think started it off for a lot of people is uh pc number four. Oh god this is this, <laughs> is, the, this is the one from the actual 89 catalog wow um, if you open up the centerfold on that catalog i don't have it out with the guitar and you zoom in with a magnifying glass you can see 004 in the actual catalog 
um, which does match up with that. Um, one hum, which was very hard to get, and not really so much hard to get, but you really never saw them. Uh, typical rounded tip. That's where Victor was saying that typically you don't get the rounded tip anymore. Ah. Um, I did have, uh, I did send this over to go over Jackson's house and he did a video for me and he did sign it at the end of the video. I just wanted him to show an old friend to him cause he was really passionate about these guitars. Um, but in my eyes, that's probably the fans know that one the most. Along yes, with, the Holy grail for me, it was the Holy grail. I've been hunting it for years, but you got it before me. <laughs> yeah. I've, I, I've got, I've got a 29 arch top here. Um, Phil's and the Love Bites was a 29, except obviously the humbucker would be here. He didn't have the single coil. Um, it's a little bit different. He does have shark fins going all the way to the end where this one doesn't. So I would say that you know his is probably the most rare out there because it's the 29. It's the first one that people saw. Um, I'd say that that's number two. Um, another one that's really big out there is a sparkle from the Love Bites video. I'm wow. sorry. Uh, let's get rock. Um, Victor will recognize this one. This has been through Victor's hands and my hands for a while. Well, actually, both of us. Um, we call this one, uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, we call Mercury. this one Mer Mercury for the Freddie Mercury. Um, actually, Victor was the one who had Dan Lawrence refinish this for him, went with the, the natural back on it. Wow. Um, we did show it to Phil and Phil signed it. But I'd say that that sparkle is probably another well-known. And Phil did have a reverse headstock on his mm. instead of, of, of a regular. Uh, and those are really, I'd say, the top three. I can't think of anyone that's a top four right now. Wow, you never showed me those before, man. You holding out? You holding out? I don't, I don't know if I had. Yeah, I guess I am holding out on you. I don't think I <laughs> I don't think I could get any more in the car when I came over. To Jersey to oh my you. God. Yeah. I, I, when you brought that hysteria over that, oh, that, that was when yeah. I, that's when I, I sprung into action and I, I got that PC one over to Dan. Cause I saw that and I said, yeah, there's pretty much nothing cooler on earth than that guitar. I mean, look at that thing. That's yeah, unbelievable. This one, yeah. This one was made uh, a guy named Jason had this custom made. I had my green, I had a green string through I had custom made. Yeah, this one made at the same time. Uh, back then they were doing the rounded headstocks. Um, and Phil did play this in Wisconsin in 2016. I got, all Adam's, I got all Adam's stuff on this. But yeah, that was fun. I never knew about the rounded headstock. This is, uh, this is some deep stuff, some deep trivia. Uh, well, yeah. if you remember Brooks. Sorry, whenever you're finished. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No. We fought over this, and I won it. Uh, there yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. So this is the only arch top that has that is in white, well, pearl white, string through, with a white headstock. Yeah. Where does that? Where'd you get that? You never told me about this one. <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel like I'm learning. I'm like guys, this was. Come on. There you go. That's the best way for me to do it. Is that way? If you can read it. Okay. Who's Jeff oh. Harad? Harad. This is the guy I bought it from. Oh, okay. Was so it it's a... February 1990. So I don't know if this is would be the earliest models from, from just looking at the actual date, as in 2021 of February 1990. It's fantastic. It's in pristine condition, hardly played. The neck is it's really wide neck, for, um, kind of like a. It's not too. It's not chunky. Just wide fretboard. But I, I, it sounds absolutely awful. The, Wait, the I'm sorry, pickups. Did you, did you say awful? awful? Absolutely awful. Horrendous. The pickups are just Jackson stock and they're terrible. I don't know. Oh, swap them gonna, out, man. I'm not going to change them because if I change them, then it's not collected. No, so. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. Man. I just leave it as is because <laughs> I respect it for it was, and I'm not going to change Hold it. Hold on a second. My own. Go back to that Vivian, the Vivian interview, which has not yet been posted, but Vivian talks about how. He got his wine red Gibson and just butchered it into the Holy Diver black matte guitar. And that's just the best story ever. That that story is kind of like, do whatever makes the guitar work for you, you know? Yeah, I'm with you on that, Alex. I leave it. I, 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 I just want for more than five seconds. So, Victor, um, I haven't I, – I guess, I mean, I've seen your photos that you post um, every so often and everything on Instagram and stuff like that. But I, I don't have a good sense of – the scope of how many guitars you have in this world, in this PC one world. And if there's anything in particular you wanted to show us, 
Um, um, I did downsize tremendously in the last year alone. It, it got to, I had, uh, I mean, obviously in the basement now, I had, I ended up making a big Excel sheet because I completely forgot some guitars I'd owned. <laughs> and it wasn't for any, you know, rhyme or reason or COVID issues or anything like that. It was simply like some of them just literally sat underneath uh, in, in the storage in cases for years at a time. And then you'd pull them out and go, oh, I have that. And it just got a little towards like the collecting just went through the roof and the playing sort of suffered because it's somewhat nice to say that, you know, you grab your, your one or two mainstays, but when it just became completely bloated. So I said, look, some of this stuff has got to go. Um, I'm a huge fan of the first and second year run of the PCs. So I prefer the old headstock. I prefer the, uh, I, I definitely prefer the, the wood selection back then, front and back. I think Brooks will agree with me on that. I, I still think it was spectacular. Um, I like the simplicity of the two, the volume and the, and the sustainer knob. So I've got the entire first run. So let me grab a few. I mean, everybody knows you get the solar and you get the, the chlorine. Um, some of the more rare ones, let me just jump up here. Euphoria, I think. That was the rarest yeah. one that everybody keeps on. Ooh, I believe yeah. this is probably one of the rare ones because this went over horribly when it first came out. So it was very, very small numbers of those. So you really, really rarely see one of these. Um, not to, you know, but I had one of these about five, six years ago. Uh, and Phil signed it in Montreal and we auctioned off for a very, very noble cause. And then it was gone. And then I think Brooks helped me find this one again. It was on eBay or Reverb or something. So I picked that up. But this is your, you know, I call it the old school. You know, the very simple controls. Uh, the back plates get tossed. Don't know where. Maybe the garbage. Dude, I can't bother. Are you sick? I, uh, I'll find I think him he, something. I think you need some more springs on that guitar. You only well, have <laughs> you only have 95 springs on the back. Uh, every guitar I own, <laughs> save for I think my Van Halen Frankie has 13s. So I, oh I have God. adopted and I am a discipline of what Phil does. And I really... You know, it's one thing to say you grab one guitar and you string it up like 13s with metal picks and because this is what Phil uses. But hand on heart, I really, really got into that in the last two decades to where every guitar I own is Daddario 13s to 56. Whew. I go to 56. He goes 54. I now know that he doesn't like a wound G. I do. I do love the metal picks. Uh, every guitar Floyd it is all titanium and the brass and whatnot. So this is one of the nicer ones that you don't really see often. Um, a couple others here. Let's let's make it easy here. After that, Euphoria color is awesome. That's a Thank beautiful you. color. Yeah, Our this is a color. really really great, somewhat rare one. I chased this fell down in Vegas a few years back. Ah, there's a black one. Yeah, my wife's birthday. This is somewhat rare because all the mochas, for whatever reason, tended to have a solid black body. Sort of like, you know, maybe the way Gibson will take a B cut and make it into a black Les Paul rather than a flame. So this is actually a beautiful mocha and it's a koa body. Oh, lovely. Really takes it up a step. And, oh, look, it still has the back plate. But hey. rest assured, there's five springs, the whole titanium. The older ones do, I find, have somewhat chunkier necks, which I do gravitate towards. Not quite in line with what Phil would custom order, but chunkier than the more modern runs and as much as people don't like this i like it this was the first run so when this came out this is what really really got me going and as much as the the strat headstocks are nice and people go for that i like the the kind of first year run so that's another particularly nice one let's toss that down and i i, I will add the reason that they painted the back of the mochas was they would always use the worst wood for the mochas and then paint them because the black and the black top looked best. They didn't want to paint the chlorine. They didn't want to paint the naturals. So all the bad wood would go to the mochas and paint the back. <laughs> That's, That's so exactly funny. right. Exactly. Makes sense. That is so funny. So here we have two nice twins. Wow. Yeah. Wait, don't you this have twins? Uh, no, they, I think Brooks owned them before. Was that correct? Yep. Yeah. I remember them. Yeah. I remember uh, this is a coal one, Ooh. and this is a non-coal one, but it's a uh, nice dark mahogany. Wow. This one is, let's just set this down and not crash anything. This one is Au Naturel. I don't think that's going to pop up, but nevertheless. And this, for rhyme or reason, because writer's block is Xerox. 
because it's just basically a twin. And again, the full on tie. So that's, I mean, that, that's the old school collection. That's the stuff that's really always worked for me. And then you've got your run of the mill. Let's put that back here. Let me not spray too much. Here we go. This is a, one of the first years as well. It's a 96. It's not a Kermit, but this is interesting because you can still see how they were playing with the dye and they weren't quite getting that deep chlorine of a swimming pool they're wanting. So there is definite, definite shades of green in this, which they must have figured out and fixed later on. But uh, I mean, this one's been around the block. This one, the sustainer broke. I got it ridiculously cheap. It had Duncan's. Uh, Brooks at one point found me a sustainer on Reaver because they are harder to find than hen's teeth and for whatever reason. So this ended up getting rewired completely by myself with a sustainer. Uh, as Alex saying, I'm not into stocks. This is an X2N. A lot of things have been changed. This has been opened up dozens of times, but you know what? It works and it's, this is a 96. So this is definitely one of the earliest ones that came out. Uh, you reminded me actually of the, the chlorine that, was it, I think Brooks, you bought it from somewhere or was it Victor, you bought it and it ended up that was Phil's stolen guitar. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I get, I, who I picked guess it up? It's back, we'll delve into that. I guess that's a good segue in, into it. Um, that's a good segue. Let's right. just come back and not kill it. And I'll just grab this while I'm sitting. So I get a box in the mail a few years back. A close neighbor, not a million miles away now. And I don't recall who, but the box had 300 postal stamps on it. This person literally stamped a PC one, just a little school like that one. And I think some issues, I think sustainer was one of the issues. So uh, I said, yeah, no problem. Send it to me and then we'll, we'll hook up for lunch in a month or two and, and, and such as such. So uh, you want me to jump into this, Brooks? So you want to yeah, keep this? No, keep, keep, keep going. I'll just, I'll keep so, the camera on the guitar. Go ahead. When I, when I take something for a setup, I take it apart. I mean, literally neck, body, tuners, it gets tightened up. I do the full, the full, the full run. So first and foremost, it's got residue of the P-touch. Okay, whatever. I do it. A lot of people do it. I'm not going to say it's fills because of that reason. So as I'm taking everything apart, underneath the humbucker mounting ring, I see two of Phil's picks that were sliced, like cut with scissors, and wedged in there. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is, on my, this is on my workbench. And uh, okay. So I, I shoot a picture off to, to Stan, Stan Schiller. It was old tech. And right away, he's like, where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? So, so that led into another discussion and a few other people got involved and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it ended up belonging to Phil. And then I'll let Brooks carry that story over. Yeah, so absolutely. So there's a couple interviews out there where Phil talks about how I own one of his stolen guitars and this is that guitar. Um, he, he was, he, as soon as he actually saw pictures of this neck, he immediately knew it was his. Um, when you compare this to really any neck of any PC one, you, you will just never, ever <laughs> see it like that. Uh, he just said it was incredibly dirty, and that's how he identified the guitar. Um, the back is a really heavy koa. Wow. Um, he did sign it for us. So what had happened was, once I found out it was his, through uh, Stan Schiller was helping us with this, um, Victor and I were going to see them in Connecticut play. I said, hey, uh, Victor, do me a favor, bring the guitar down. I want to give it back to Phil since it's his guitar. But we also were thinking, okay, so the guitar is stolen. So now we've got a Canadian trying to bring across a border a stolen rock star guitar <laughs> to a concert, and who's going to believe that? Um, so, you know, it all worked out in the end. We brought it to, I think it was Mohegan Sun, Victor, in, in That's Connecticut right. yeah. at, at the casino. And uh, we brought a few guitars, and I opened this up. I said, Phil, this is yours. He opened it up. He said, yep, absolutely. Um, this is mine, and I was trying to give it back to him. I'm like, karma, I don't want anything to do with this guitar. And, yeah, he was identifying the neck is definitely, you know, and it, dirty, it dirtied up so much, but it's a beautiful. It's not, when you say dirty, it's not dirty, dirty. It's darkened up so much. Wait, so, and, uh, so someone stole the guitar from yeah. Phil Collin, and Correct. then it ended up, with with you or Victor? With Victor. 
Well, it went it went around, and I bought it from our friend Ian up in uh, Canada. Oh, I know Ian. But, yeah, right. Yeah, you know Ian. But it was having some problems, so Victor, being my guitar tech guy, my guru, uh, oh. basically it went to him. It went to him. Oh, okay. I didn't know you were his guitar tech. Oh, okay, that works out. So Phil didn't even want it back. No, I tried. I said, okay, Phil, if you don't want it back, give me something else. If if you don't want it, I'll take, you know. Uh, a fender i'll just take something yours he goes nope he goes you take it and if i ever need it i know who has it and it, i don't want to say it got uncomfortable but it got to the point of phil please take this damn thing back it's karma i don't want any and he said no i don't want it so if you ever catch any of those interviews he basically says the same thing that you know yeah. that's but, that. but just just to point the significance of this guitar as well it's not that a guitar that he used live but Apparently, he recorded X with it, the Correct. album X. Yeah. That's amazing. I, yeah, you know that, what? That, yeah. and, it's, and it's funny because once, once I found out it was used on the Euphoria tour, I started looking at the quilts on the tops. I've come to find out, I had a ton of photos. It's in the uh, tour book. It's on the shirt. When you see the Euphoria uh, concert T-shirt with the five guys on there, Phil is holding this guitar, playing it. I can match wow. up the quilts. So it was, it was a cool find. Wow. That is amazing. That. Yeah, I mean, there's some amazing guitars here, guys, that I – I mean, even knowing you guys, I didn't, I wasn't aware that some of these things existed. It's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of existence, I suppose that's, that's a good point to, to – to, um, through the custom runs, okay? Because Brooks really started this, and I blame you for this, Brooks. <laughs> you really started this by going, okay, I've had something on order with Jackson. Like, okay, so you can order custom ones from Jackson. That's fantastic. It was reasonable at that time, price-wise, yep. to order from Jackson. And you can get something like, I think, what was it, $2,500, something. That's kind of like the max, I believe. Or was it right. cheaper than that? Yeah. For, you can go mad with the, with the options. But then it became ridiculous now. And the wait times, too, I think, have become... I think it was Alex was saying, you were saying... If you get a guitar in two years, that that's a bloody miracle. That that was a, another thing too, where I think it's yeah. off a few people, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Because because you Brooks, you started one guitar. I think it was the um, the satin wood. You made one, and Phil was so in love with it, he ended up making one for himself. Was it as a oh, oh the lace wood. lace wood? Sorry, apologies, lace wood. Yeah. Yeah, I showed him that in New York City. Uh, he ended up taking uh, Irving Plaza. Uh, he loved it, borrowed it, and gave it back to me at PNC. Come to find out, he had had one made during the tour. Apparently, mine sounded better than his. And Stan was saying, well, may hey, Phil, maybe you should give Brooks your new one because it had a reverse headstock and it was a lace wood. But Phil's like, no, no, I want to give Brooks back his original. So, okay, yeah. so, so what was the difference? As in, did you go for any particular spec? Did you just ask Jackson, Jackson just make me, a, I don't know, a, a standard run of these? Or did you particularly went for a chunk, chunkier neck? Or No, it was just a lace wood with, uh, with solid lace wood. I went with bird's eye maple neck because I just think the bird's eye necks are just so cool. Yeah. And uh, a regular headstock. And that was it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he went with a reverse headstock, so it was a little different. He said he didn't want to duplicate mine, so he did a reverse headstock. So you you guys have been showing a lot of the earlier PC ones, you know, the pre Fender headstock, um, and because yeah, I, yeah, sorry, you know, and it begs the question, you know, because if you look at my collection, it's like I don't have any of those, and I wanted to kind of go back to when I was younger and these things came out. Um, they were always pricey guitars; they're always high end guitars. I mean, the prices have inflated over years, but it was it was an expensive guitar at the time. There was a local store. There weren't too many guitar stores out here in New York, um, but they had one. So I, you know, I tried it out. Like you can't really do that in stores anymore. But back in the day, I did, and I remember holding that neck and saying, "I can't play this guitar. Like <laughs> it's just the necks are just way too big." And that's really why I never bought PC ones until really late in the game. Really late in the game. And the only reason I got one was because when I ordered it custom through Custom Shop. I could get a slimmer neck. Which one was that, Alex? The first guitar I ever got was was the, was in a PC One Adrenalize with a Fender headstock, and shockingly, I sold this guitar, which led me. I thought it's the one that you have. No, it led me down a spiral. 
that I never recovered from, which is why now I have like eight PC ones because I was just so <laughs> traumatized by that. Well, Alex, I'll have to lend you this one one of these days. Is that right, the like little skinny necks? Oh yeah. my god, that that thing is That's huge. A baseball box. Yeah, that thing's yeah. enormous. That's the fattest absolute neck they make. Wait, what is First that? Time this was ordered, I got an email back saying, "Excuse me, sir." Was this a, a typo or is this a mistake? And I give them <laughs> exact specs with the calipers. I go, no, this is the neck. This is it. Okay. So I've done a few like that, uh, including you, a tally that Phil really, really, really bonded with. Can you raise that again? Because you couldn't see it. Really. Um, no, show the body because I don't know what guitar that is. That's my Felix. Oh, you have a Felix? All right. That's you know what? Felix. We're stopping this call right now. We're stopping this call right now. <laughs> this call is, <laughs> this call is <laughs> over. This call is over. That's my <laughs> Felix 2.0 because my – Earlier, Felix was sold to a, another mutual friend of ours. And then I said, you know what? Let's do a, a 2.0. Let's make it, you know, 70 Strat, bullet headstock. Let's make it 22 fret. Let's make it, again, that monster, monster neck. Uh, we'll do Phil's Sugar Chakras. We'll do the Titanium, the whole nine yards. And uh, yeah, this one. I don't want to know about this. Really, really want to know about this. I mean, Alex, really. we all have one. Come on, Alex. <laughs> all right. This is like. <laughs> I feel this is like a punked, like I'm getting punked right now because everyone's got a feeling. So, wait, was that a custom creation or was that out of Jackson Custom Shop? This, uh, the first one was literally a 78 Strat, like what Phil got from his mom for his 21st. So I, 78 Strat, you find all day long. Uh, I did a bit of the mods myself. A friend of mine did the paint and whatnot. Wow. And then I ended up selling that to a mutual friend. And this time around was literally sort of like a, a mutt. A mutt, like a, a neck, mutt. a body, uh, the Demarzios, which I pretty much assembled. And uh, this is literally, you know, like I said to Phil, this is Felix 2.0, Felix 2 in Roman numerals. That's amazing. Uh, obviously, Strat body, uh, uh, Ash, I think it's an Ash, typical. It's a heavy guitar. It's a 70 Strat. It's a four bolt, you know, the Floyd, his pickups. But again, just that monster, monster neck. So did you have Any the, particular yeah. sound? Sorry, Alex, to cut across you. Apologies. Any particular distinctive? Yeah, uh, other than being say, just the fat neck and, and the three chakras. But well, I mean, the fat neck changes everything. There's no denying that. Um, the uh, the arch top that that uh, Brooks has now, the the glitter one, had a really skinny neck. Like think Ivan as gem, and lovely guitar. And even that, I was stretching thirteens and and being a little nervous. I just couldn't bomb it at one point. I really really gravitated towards a thick one. So. The big fat neck just does, it does change everything. Absolutely. Hands on. So the same thing goes with my adrenalize. Dan had painted a phenomenal adrenalize for me. Just stunning. But again, a really skinny, very skinny Jackson neck that I just didn't bind with. So the big fat necks, uh, there's a tremendous amount of sustain. I think Adam had done one, uh, Adam at FU Tone, Adam Reaver, a great fella, did a review in a video about two months back where he had yeah. Bill ship one of his guitars, and it, it, it's kind of like this. This will sustain with no sustainer. Like, you, you're sitting there, like, it just goes on and on. I mean, the amount of mass and wood, you just can't, you know, you can't beat that. And the pickups are unbelievable because they go, I think, 21, 22K, which is ridiculously overwhelmed for a single coil. So it screams like a full humbucker, full-on Super 3, and yet... It cleans up like a beautiful strap pickup. So this is literally my go-to. This is extremely, so, extremely versatile. Did you have to? Is that a is that a, a recess Floyd or is that mounted? Yeah, that's a recess Floyd. So did you have to cut? Did you have to cut that? Yeah. So this was a. I don't recall where I got this from. I know where I got the neck from. This was a standard strap body, standard strap specs SSS, and then I have a route. I did the template. I routed back for the recess. And then I had a buddy of mine painted because he's got a better paint booth. I can't paint. I That's mean, amazing. I didn't want to spray can on a guitar like this. I love that. I mean, when we spoke to Phil, we were like, I was like, you should make a Felix run. Yeah. Right? I mean, that would be a run that would make sense. That that'd yeah. be a run that, you know, didn't have the graphic involved and da da da, you know. Yeah. I'd always it'd get my way. It'd be quicker to turn around. Yeah, it'd be quicker yeah. to turn around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of people will gravitate towards the bell or something else. Cause this aside from Phil's, it was his mom's birthday gift. For most people, it's just a Strat and a Floyd. So it doesn't connect as it would to, you know, Def Leppard fans or something. But well, I remember bringing this and uh, Brooks Destroyer, which I'll certainly get to. And uh, he, he just loved them both. I mean, just literally plugged them in and was like, wow. I mean, this is, you know, his guitar. It's his specs. This well, you is see, mar marketing-wise, 
it could be done that it's the hysteria guitar full stop that's it if you want to get the hysteria sound this is what yeah. um yeah. produce it exactly he said it himself he didn't record with a jackson he didn't record anything no, else everything was with he the fields, recorded with a fender and a Kaler yeah. and, uh, it's amazing. Uh -huh. that's it yeah absolutely and even and he and he said as well that steve every now and then he would grab uh, Felix and play it like uh, he was in love with it yeah. as well. Yeah, so absolutely. you never know. You never know what will happen in the future. Yeah. So guys, this was I just wanted to show, share this with you because this was uh, this was the PC One Solar, and it's got the Fender headstock, and it's it actually has a really thin neck. So I don't know when I don't know when the production models changed because I remember when I when I picked up a pre Fender production. It, it had a bigger it had a bigger neck and when people ask me like oh you know you know what's the neck like and stuff like that i, I do remember those original pre-fenders to have really chunky necks um well i don't know because the one that i look at and i'm not just showing my collection um the ash that i have it's comfortable neck i wouldn't say it's slim it's comfortable so it's not if I'm going to compare it, like, say, to Shred, the one that I have is definitely a bigger neck than, than a pre-Fender one. Interesting. I don't know why. Yeah. Now, the, the modern PC-1s, really, you know, now that I've seen, you know, some of the guitars in your collections, I mean, the modern PC-1s are a lot different, right? They have the baked necks. Um, they have a, a, fuller, a fuller neck than this, probably. The, like, kind of like a, feels like a D, like a small D. And um, they have those... Matte, matte, matte finishes, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, new one. Yeah. So I'm really curious to see, you know, where it goes next. You know, if he goes back to some of the glossy stuff, or oh, hello, hey, doggy. Hey. Okay. I, I have to say, I'm not a really. I wasn't really a fan of the matte PC ones. Anyway, like, I'm, it's it's an. A personal preference, I suppose. Um, I just didn't really see the point. To yeah, be very honest with you. Yeah, I didn't. I, I'm old school, as you guys know. I'm like Victor, two hum, ke, uh, Koa, and I just, I don't know the price. But, but well, yeah, forget about the price. We can't do anything about it, unfortunately. But in terms of the spec, they could really up their game, Jackson. Mm -hmm. They could look at other competitive, uh, I suppose, brands. What they're doing, they're offering exotic woods to a degree they're having that option i don't know but they seem to be that sticking to what works from jackson's mm -hmm. point of view that's it it's mahogany you know slap a top on top of it and that's it that's enough i did get the um the dark walnut and um the the latest guitar and i gotta say i mean i have a lot of those guitars it it really is beautiful it has a look to it that um really stands out um because i was skeptical i was like oh it's going to be just another pc one with another top but it, it it almost has like a obsidian type of top to it like it's just it's almost shiny um like it's like a poly it's really it's a beautiful guitar i mean now that i have it in the collection i i definitely don't don't regret it um but can compare it say to um any of the other guitars that you have like, let, let me grab it for tone a second. wise or yeah. let, let me just grab it for a second Hold on should have got wireless. I should have got wireless earbuds. Um, so, can you guys see the finish? Interesting. Yeah, it's it's like almost black. I mean, you can't really see the flame or it's like the a mocha one. You really can't see the flame unless you you know. But the neck is like a. It's like um, splatter. Okay, so it's comfortable. It's not too big. Yeah, it's like a wide, you know, and it's got a really nice ebony finger. So, and it's got the X two ends, um, which the shred has yeah um and i i really you know i got the the epiphone which has the x2 ends and i was been playing the hell out of it and um they're awesome i mean so much of that tone so much of that tone that you hear if you listen closely um are those x2 ends for sure you know um it's got the reverse headstock so so i guess it's kind of you know the way i wanted to with this video is to show kind of the earliest to really the late, I would say this is the most recent PC one that's been released. Yeah, it looks expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it really is beautiful. I mean, it honestly, like I don't really look at guitars as luxury items. I mean, I look at them as you know guitars that you play. Um, but if you wanted a, if you wanted a guitar that was 
really beautiful, like really a showpiece. I mean, this is really, I mean, I, I actually, I love the, the, the Clara Walnut, but I would say from a shock value, like, wow, this is beautiful. You know? Well, okay. Okay. No, maybe, I think Victor and, and Alex, both of you, you're not going to be um, involved in this or particularly in love with the ash body, the PC ones. It's only myself and Brooks that picks them up. So Brooks, you managed to get a second one. Yeah, I did. Uh, right here. Do you know the dates of that second one? Mine is December mm. 02. I do. I'd have to look in the case. I don't have it. I don't have it out. I find these really fantastic tone-wise. They're very clear. They, they're warm. Um, I, I, I do like them. I mean, there's nothing I, I, I think there's nothing I don't like about them. <laughs> this actually would be following what, what, I, what uh, Victor said. This is my go-to guitar. Yeah. I but just bond nice. with it. I, I know exactly the sound that... that um, I like the one produce. on the right. The, the one on the right has a, a nice book match top, top to it. That's pretty cool. Look at that. And they're very light. They yeah, very Ash light. is a very light guitar. I have a Sir that's yeah. Ash. It's uh, it's it's one of my favorite guitars for sure. So I was really surprised that they didn't continue. Well, the whole thing. I don't know, Brooks, if you know anything about that, this run, how it came to be. Because no. the way I got it, basically, it was, what's his, I can't even remember his name, GMW. Um, what's the guy who ran that? Uh, Lee Garver. I think, yeah, Lee. He emailed me and said, do you want this? I have. There's two of them. Pick one. Yeah, yeah. And I picked the one with the flamed uh, fingerboard. That's, yeah, so that's they the had, one. Sorry. So they had one at Nam. It was Ash with a rosewood board. I ended up buying that. And after that, they did make a few more with different configurations. But they only did what we think there's maybe what five, six, maybe. I think. Five, I think. Yeah. I think six. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Especially yeah. with the one that was complete surprise that you showed, the, the second one that you got, that's the sixth, I think. Because yeah. I only know there's only five ever made. Well, ironically, I was ha I put mine up on Reverb for a while just to kind of see what it would do. A guy emailed me and says, hey, I have one too. Do you know anybody that might want it? I'm like, yeah, me. So I pulled mine, <laughs> so I pull, so I pulled mine off. And he sold me his. So. <laughs> All right, so guys, I just want to make this very clear going forward amongst the four of us. So anyone selling anything, it goes in between this group first, <laughs> or first review, and then it goes out. I don't want to be hearing that there's a Felix go. on eBay. I don't I know agree. that. I agree. I agree. Uh, did, you, did you not mention the, the Pyromania video? So I got to show one of Brooks's that uh, I'm, I'm keeping safe at this point. Whoa. Um, That's yeah. a beast. So this... Mm. Uh, do you want me to describe this book? So you want to jump yeah, in? Go ahead. It's all you. So this was a run-of-the-mill 84 or 85 destroyer, the high-end one, the neck through, which uh, Brooks had shipped down to me. And then a mutual friend of ours, my go-to luthier, Mark Reed, I brought this to him and we had a few ideas kick around. So I'll keep this short and sweet. Mark steamed the neck off the body like a Les Paul, the so neck, one side. Body was then plain down about the thickness of the binding. Then a, it's very hard to see, it doesn't photograph well, but it's a very dark kind of mocha quilt top, book matched, was sourced from Vancouver because being so large of a body and getting it book matched took a lot of real estate. So that was a quilt top on top. Then it was routed for a proper Floyd. Then we did the full three pickups. These are three DiMarzios. This is a Evolution Super 3, Super 3. And Mark painted it, refretted it, jumbo frets, beautiful real mother of pearl, totally, totally refinished the guitar, uh, ended up wearing it. I ended up wearing it. It's your Les Paul configuration. Then the middle is push-pull ah. because even Phil never uses the middle. And on a lot of his, it's actually disconnected. It's just really show, no go. And then Adam with his FU Tone titanium, titanium block, brass. Killer, killer, killer guitar. I'm it's heavy. For days, neck heavy. through. It's a chunky neck. It's a, a 60s Les Paul neck, if that gives you any kind okay. of... Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. It's but not too bad. This just screams pyromania. That's so, absolutely unbelievable. Brooks, I don't think you've ever shown me that, man. This is... Brooks, I haven't seen it. it. I haven't seen it. So, 
So Victor, Victor came up with this whole COVID thing, so I can't get across to Canada to go get it. So, <laughs> oh, now we know. So not only do we see some of these guitars, but now we know where COVID came from. This has been. I haven't. This, I, this is, I haven't seen that. He, he's had that for over a year. This now, is news breaking. Um, he's actually never seen it. He's never literally played it yet. So you know, if Phil, COVID lasts uh, another ten years, Phil, uh, Phil. I think by default it becomes mine. I think that's some legal law somewhere. Phil saw it before I did. Yep. That is amazing. That guitar is Guys, sick. I, I think the thing that I think um, is important for people to know is that Def Leppard had this kind of, you know, not rough period, but, you know, a period where grunge came and, you know, a lot of the bands from that era were kind of disregarded, right? And I think that was really tough for fans of the band, you know, who really love the band and think the band deserved more recognition. I mean, I, for me, Pyromania and Hysteria just alone, you know, for me, it's just like, that's it. You're, you know, you have God status with those albums. Um, and what I think is really cool about the splatter is that when the splatter came out, the band was at that kind of lull, I would say, where they had their fans, they could tour, you know, they were playing decent sized places, but you know, I saw them on the X tour. I saw them, you know, in those albums that didn't get as much attention. Um, and the splatter came out, you know, I don't think there was a lot of, attention on the band um and which means there's less attention on phil and there's less less attention on the guitars um and it just was not a guitar that um most people would run out to get and it was not a cheap guitar i don't remember what they retailed for but were they about six thousand five thousand no no, no I think 30 or 36 am yeah. i am, am yeah. i correct really i think they were a lot more get. expensive than that um i recall them being more expensive but I think the funny thing is now is that whoever got those got them because they were really hardcore fans. Mm -hmm. um, there were not people who were, you know, profiteering. There were not people who were taking advantage. I think the people who got them then got them. Mm -hmm. And then as the band ascended, and, and I think the band ascended, I think Viva Hysteria was the beginning of the return for them. Um, because there was something so pure about that concert I, I i'm did you guys all go to one show of viva hysteria no. in vegas no yeah no, no i did not i missed that so th there was an, an excitement from the hardcore fans being together like that um which was an amazing feeling i guess it's like being at like a star trek convention like a bunch of trekkies you know but no everyone was obsessed with def leppard and it was the most amazing thing to be with those fans like together and they played you know the dead flatboard flatbird you know you know yeah. intro set where they played all these hardcore you know songs that i haven't heard in a long time like mirror mirror and all this great stuff um and i saw the splatter and i i went home that week and i was like with my wife and i'm like listen i'm like i gotta get that guitar i i have to get that guitar and luck luckily there was still one floating around i Based on my first question, I probably pay a little bit more than you guys did, but um, in, in in hindsight, <laughs> in hindsight, it was worth it. So now the splatter has become, you know, the Frankenstrat of like of Phil Collin, and it's like the the porn stars episode and stuff like that. And then you see I think like it's because of that episode. Yeah, I think it's because of that episode. Um, even before the episode, to be honest with you, um, they came out in 2010. I missed them. I, I wasn't uh, around that time basically uh, to buy them. I remember that Brooks, you had number one, or something like yes. that. Yeah, number yep, one. I can you imagine one. number one? And you let it go. I had, ironically, I had number one bought off of eBay for I want to say under thirty four hundred dollars. Oh my god! Yeah, did long you get, time ago. Did you get rid of that one? Yeah, I had somebody that was buying it for their son. Uh, made some money off of it, but you know, it was it was cool to have number one. Well, I th well yeah. when I was looking for one. I found one collector and he, I offered, okay, would you consider selling it? He said, yeah, I'll sell it for 8K. That's way too much. Yeah. So I could say that I got mine off, I got, off a dealer in Italy. I was so happy. I got it off a dealer in Italy, a Fender dealer in Italy, who still had it, never sold. Nobody bought it in Italy. He had it on eBay.it. Mm. So the minute I saw that, I was like, it, it doesn't even, doesn't show on eBay.com. By the way, you have right. to hunt, hunt well. Um, got it immediately, and I paid for for something, let's say. Huh? And then I told the wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think what makes a splatter special, other than it being really cool looking, I think the fact that 
you know, he, he took part in the creation. I think that's what made it for fans and collectors. Like, you know, the fact that, you know, he splattered it and he put his initials in it. And, you know, I think that's what made it really special. Um, it's a unique, each one is completely unique. And I got to find, by the way, who equal, they can do, you know, like they, I've seen other, other brands to do this where they do like a certain finish, like a drip or whatever. And people really want it. So what they do is they do it differently. So for example, like Phil could do like a neon splatter, you know, or like, you know what I'm saying? Like he could do a splatter with different color schemes to differ, differentiate the original run of splatter. Okay. And you know what I'm talking about? We, by the way, that's an idea that we, we didn't float around yet. But, you know, if, if people wanted another splatter, they could do splatter 2.0, but they would just do it with different colors. I don't know. It's well, an idea. He, he, okay, I'm a fan of Joe Satriani, okay? And he did the Joe Satriani art run one and then a second one. Exactly, art two. right. And they go retail price, something like $7,000, $8,000. That's, that's if you're going to buy it from a dealer like that. Because each one is a basically an, an, an art that he painted himself. It's not that he splattered from them or anything. So they did a run one and a run two because run one was completely gone immediately. I don't know that a... The splatter run two would work. I don't, uh, I don't either. I don't. But I it's have just no idea. Idea. I'm just trying but to satisfy. Yeah. Jackson's 30th anniversary, and that was a a page in history that dare I say worked well then and there. So that that might be a difficult difficult sell again. And then then let's be frank: the people who bought splatter one will be up in arms because saying like, "Well, where's my value now?" I mean, there's how many 59 less Pauls? 1700. That's why it's the Holy Grail. So all the R8s and R9s, good for you. It's not a 59. So there's a, there's a sort of exclusiveness to a limited run. And that goes That's back to maybe where the, the, the arch tops was, uh, they would said it'd be 12 or 14. And then I think it got out to 24, 26 and whatnot. And there's a lot of grumblings where people are saying it's, it's not that limited anymore once the numbers escalate to a certain amount. But, but, but not that, if I could add in. I don't know, Brooks, you share the same point of view as mine. It For me, I would consider an art shop only the one that was less than 70, the one that was that were done in the early 90s and not after that. Yeah, yeah the, body, the body shape changed. Um, each one is hand carved. So obviously, depending upon who's carving it, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a different body style. Yeah. 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 So guys, because so even not Brooks is to grow over, yeah. there, there was no CNC back then. No. It right. was literally, and the amount of wood wasted if you would, to do that carve was, was tremendous. Yeah. And obviously the new run at Fender was CNC and they were all consistent, but different. And people wanted the sustainer, some didn't want the sustainer. Uh, when that whole thing with Matt started coming around, I was really active in that forum at that point. And I didn't want it. I wanted an old school. I wanted the rounded headstock. I didn't want a Kaler for God's sakes, because <laughs> you can't give that away. Hey now. Hey now, sorry. But I, I wanted I, literally... I, I, I wanted, you know, I don't want a sustainer. I've got enough guitar sustainers. And to be frank, I've got enough guitars that the sustainer doesn't work half the time that I'm troubleshooting. So I didn't want that. But the majority won, and people wanted the modern version with the the the, the, the empty, make, the painted, the non-painted neck and sustainer. And you know what? Good for them. It sold well. So you guys have um, some unbelievable guitar. I mean, collectively, we all have unbelievable guitars. So as kind of like uh, – because. As, as kind of a, not, not a closing question, but a question I think wraps it all together. Are there any guitars individually that you guys still kind of pine for? You know, I mean, you, you have some oh, rare ones, but like, so stuff, let, let me, let me start with you. So when you think about, okay, like I have some great guitars, but this is the one I still kind of want. Do you, do you have that? Yeah, absolutely. And what is it? <laughs> Brooks has it. <laughs> <laughs> It's We're, number four, art stuff number four. Oh, okay, art yeah. number four. Okay, that's um, basically few, to me few is. People, few people yeah. want that. So, so Victor, it's, I mean, uh, it's the ultimate one. Do you have a guitar that you're still is on your list? Your, I think I think my wife should hear this and probably record this for for posterity. But um, thirty five, if not forty years of playing, I I also repair guitars and I, I buy self flip guitars. I personally owned in excess of 300 guitars. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but that, that could be, you know, a $200 Squire. That can be a 70 Les Paul. So put that in prosperity. 
Uh, no, ironically, no. I have a very, very well-rounded collection. I wanted my first run of the PC ones. Um, I'm big on, I don't want to bore you with this. I'm big on old early seventies Fender Strats with the big kind of bullet headstock, kind of like the, the, the Felix. So I've got my you know vintage Strats. I've got a couple of vintage Tellys. I've got three Les Pauls. I've got, yes, I have my Van Halen Frankie. I have a gem, believe it or not. I've got a couple uh, Van Halens. N no, believe it or not, no, I haven't actually looked uh, on eBay for the longest time. Um, I, I've kind of got to a point when I was telling a mutual guitar friend of mine the other day, I've got a really, really well-rounded collection. So, And I do lend out some pieces to close friends for recording or whatnot. And oh. and that's the comment I get is like really, really nice, well-rounded. Like, yeah, you've got your Floyd Rose guitars and all that nonsense, but you want a bit of Gilmore and here's your you know vintage Strat. You want some Joe Bonham Massa, there's a 71 gold top, or I've got a, nice. a Les Paul with actual path number pickup so I, I think i've hit a sort not a plateau my my interest hasn't waned i'm still super super diehard guitar geek and but just getting that there's not a whole lot out there that i would really really consider purchasing or if, if there is i haven't seen it yet i mean i do the run of the mill les paul's telly strats jackson's i love the walnut it's beautiful i won't lie to you there's a, there's also a common thing that the price point being in canada mm -hmm. Is about mm. 35, maybe 40 percent more. Wow! So the, if the what was the latest one? The walnut one was what yeah. seven US. Yeah. So by the time that hits my door, I'm uh, probably around 11, 11,000. That's astounding. Yeah, that number so is. That also. The number. Same, same, thing, here, same thing here. Same thing. The yeah. prices. EU, yeah. The prices do start to, um, yeah. you know, create a problem, and I also think it creates hostility towards the brand um, because I think people feel. Um, alienated by you know the exclusivity of it and um and i gotta be honest i'm sure people look at my collection and they they, they look at me and they're like i hate this guy and it's like i would hate me too but like i'm not making the prices and i'm i'm making a personal decision to spend money that i probably shouldn't be on things that i like um but um yeah i think the prices do get to a point where the the collecting becomes less fun um and unfortunately i don't think that's something that uh we're going to be able to change with where the economics are going with all the stuff. Um, so Brooks, do you have, is there anything left that you could possibly not have had or come across <laughs> in your time? Phil's so original 29. About, Did I yeah, answer that, that Brooks? So I'll talk about two. I had, and my, my buddy Adam has it right now. Mm. I had the yellow double neck. Oh, from Jackson. Yes. Uh, custom made. They mimicked Phil's. This here is the neck from his first one that not too many people have seen. Uh, it had the, the 12 tuners on the head. Oh, so my is, God. So he, he can hunt still, with that. So That's a spear. Original yeah. 12 neck headstock. Um, it was too top heavy, and they went to a six on the head and six in the body like they do now. Um, so, I, yeah, I wish I had that back from Adam, but that's, uh, this was a cool neck. Uh, That's amazing. That is the double neck from the Euphoria. I, mean, I have a guitar magazine with the Euphoria photo shoot and Phil yep, standing okay. there with the yellow one. And I, Adam always posts it on Instagram and every time he posts it, I get severely triggered. Um, but then I, I step back and then I... Yeah. Brooks, if you don't mind me asking, did you sell it directly to Adam or he ended up... No, there? sold it to another guy in Pennsylvania who picked it up and then Adam picked it up from there. Oh. Okay, okay. So it's, you always yeah. can. You can it's the nice thing about these things, you can track, you know, how, how many hands you know exchange yeah. the, the guitars. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, this um, is, yeah. Go ahead. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to Victor's point that okay, you've you've got everything. There's nothing really that would intrigue you. So looking at the last, I suppose, announcement from from Phil that we're gonna try to get a Bella limited mm -hmm. run. Yeah. I'm only speaking from my opinion, not affiliated with Def Leppard, Phil, or, or Jackson, any of that. To me, a Bella guitar is really the, is the ultimate Phil Collins guitar. It's Absolutely. the ultimate. With, 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 with everything else, is lovely and fantastic. Absolutely. But that one is always that, it's the ultimate one, like the Holy Grail, or the ultim, ultimate one. So if they're going to do one of 10, 12 guitars, they're going to be very expensive guitars. Oh, without a doubt. Because I think you had brought up, what do you, one of you lads brought up 
licensing, which I didn't really think about because they do yeah, have. To. Yeah, they it's have. It's like the Hendrix or the James Dean estate, so it'll be very pricey. But I mean, I'll, I'll give you a quick note. Uh, I held Bella. I don't know, recall two summers ago, four summers ago, but whenever Phil and the gang rolled into town, and Scotty handed it to me, and I remember saying, "This is so not Phil," because it's it, very it, thin. It's a have you have you held it? It's a ridiculously yes. skinny neck. Neck. And of course, the body is so iconic because it had a Kaler Spider, then it had the Kaler Cam, then it had a Shaler Floyd, then it had the Floyd Rose and and the various pickups. And we joke the Elton uh, Elton John glasses. But I said to Scotty, like, how did he never end up just with a replacement neck at some point? You know, put the other one away for posterity because it's so so not Phil. And he said, well, look, it, it's Bella. It's it is what it is, but. It's a beautiful guitar, and it's it's beyond iconic. And you know, Phil says it best: it gets into more places than he does. <laughs> that's that's his quote, literally. So, so my my question, and, and, and again, this is not any legal binding or anything. Would you go for it? No, no, I wouldn't, because hand on heart, the specs are not what I'm doing these days. I, I'm, I think I've gravitated away from collecting that's literally hanging on the wall as wall art. Because I'll say one thing, when COVID really hit and I was home for about two weeks, it was a well-earned vacation, I went through every one of my guitars. And no matter how well I take care of things, and I'm a fairly competent tech, the intonation, the action with our climate was through the roof. So I tweaked and set up every guitar, changed a ton of strings and did everything. But that was the turning point where like, okay, is this a Van Gogh on the wall or is this something I'm actually playing once in a while? And the same thing happened with my amps. I had a plethora of vintage Marshalls, Fenders, beautiful things, modded, lovely amps. Friends came over. My God, what have you got here? And I literally said, this is it. I'm done. I run an Axe FX through a Randall, through a 412, pretty well mimicking Phil's setup. That's it. I have one I have one old tube Randall modified that I chatted with Gary Sunday at one point. That's another story. But I really, really stripped it down. So... Price point aside, no, because I don't think the specs many women are my liking. I just don't want a skinny, tiny little neck. And I don't think they'll relic it the way they should. I don't think they'll do the, you know, as Dan Lawrence calls it, the, the Elton John glasses, because I think Brooks brought this up years ago. He told me this one. They couldn't paint the mounting rings. The paint wouldn't adhere to the mounting rings. Mm -hmm. So that was the whole Elton John glasses. So if they did a really nice one, all reliced up with the wear, it'd be interesting, but... It wouldn't be my spec, so it would literally be behind on the wall at some point. You're not gonna find yourself. Past that. A, you won't find yourself a year or so later going like. I'm no, sure the bottle on. no. I, I've seen all the newer ones. I mean, the only thing I really like about the new Jacksons, the truss rod is at the bottom now, which is great because the old school ones a lot got stripped. It was a really really flawed design, uh, but no, it, it's really gotten to where I wanted to whittle it down to a, a decent amount that does get played and. I think every collector, you know, faces that same quandary, you know, yeah. it's like, what, what is the point of the collection? And, um, I trust me being home as long as I have, I have, I have those moments and I'm just like, I could probably sell like 10 of these and I wouldn't even know the difference. And then I just say, you know what? My life wouldn't really be much different. I just have less awesome guitars. So I I've come to the conclusion that, you know, it is what it is. If I don't play them enough, I'll get around to it one day. I mean, I probably, I don't have 300 guitars, you know? Um, I mean, I guess at some point I always looked at, you know, I did always look at the collection as something to be shared with others. And I, and I mean, I truly mean that. Like I picture myself retiring at some point with some cool place where people could come and experience them and actually experience. And, and that's some of the, one of the things I think as a collector, which is, great about the PC one page and Instagram and all these things is that I think there's collectors who are very like they're braggers, you know, they're like, Oh, look at all these expensive things I own and blah, blah, blah. And look how cool and rare this is. And I, I hate that. You know, I've always been about, you know, if you guys could come over right now and play them all, I would be excited. Like I, I had never been about the exclusivity. Yeah, because there's a history yeah. and a story behind them. I hear you a hundred percent. You know, I so agree. I think I look at my collection as something at some point I will expose to, to people to be able to come in. Maybe it's like a, I don't know what it would be, but, but it's some kind of studio environment where you'd come in and you'd be able to, you know, I don't own an Axe FX, but, you know, imagine you could come in and play the splatter, you know, like the ultimate 
fan experience, like play the splatter through an Axe FX and maybe get a lesson in, on how to play a leopard song or I don't know. That's my, that's my dream. But so my collection isn't necessarily about investments. It's more about like having these cool things and then maybe at some point having the ability to share it with people. You know, I, I think, I, I, yeah, I think mine is more, I have very limited uh, collection anyway, but it's, my collection, I think, I look at it as kind of like a historical sort of a thing. As this is what existed back in the days. Kind of look, mm -hmm. I know I'm not going to be, uh, I'll use that as an example. It's like the old, the first one of the gems, or let's go mad and say like the or nines or the or eights. Limited number of things that existed back in the day for that particular artist. And it's been well um, taken care of uh, and, and it's documented. I really like the thing about documenting these things. So when we did the call with Phil, documenting how many of these guitars existed, because it's never been done before. And that's the whole point where we did the call with Phil. So that's kind of my point of interest in, OK, I'm, I play every single instrument here except for the arch stop. I just don't like the sound of it, but I just strum it every now and then I put it back in the case. But all the other ones get played. They're not a, an art. Well, I never hang them on the wall. I never do. They're in their cases. Take them out, plug them in. I play that. I play the shit out of them. Sorry. And then I put it back in the case. Well, not to cut you off, but do you recall, it might still be on Phil's Facebook page at one point a decade ago, he or somebody started photographing some of his most iconic guitars, and then it yeah. stopped for whatever reason, because whatever, life took over. But you saw Felix back then, you saw Felix, when it was, yeah, when it was, the wood was tearing before Mike Shannon fixed it, you saw Bella, you saw Kermit, you saw whatnot. And I remember looking at that and going, my God, what I wouldn't give to shop at Phil's or at I won't say where other places with a cannon and start shooting all of his guitars because you know he said himself one interview said how many do you have having a clue between California between the UK between the Joe's between storage lockers but to see what he's really got aside from his iconic ones like his SG and his Felix would be just fantastic you guys brought up something that I think would be an amazing idea um, and I've seen a lot of Facebook groups do this. Um, they create a book, like an anthology book. You know how you can make your own books now? Like if you go to like Shutterfly, you can create a yeah. bound book with a cover. Why don't we make a, a Phil Collin guitar anthology book for ourselves? Like, I mean, that we could like, yeah, like that. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I love that. Beauty of the Burst. But why don't we do yeah. that? You could do the same as that. Yes, I have I mean, that idea. And, and I'm in. I'm in. We could do it. We could do it as a, a couple of things. We could do it. Ba basically, you can print it on demand. Like we can get all the photos, right? We can kind of create this thing. We could print some samples to see if it would look like. And then if we actually sold them, we'd like give it, we'd sell it for charity. You know, we do it for charity or something. But I, I think that would be amazing to take all these awesome guitars that we have together the modern years, the early years, you know, maybe some stuff that Phil has given us stuff from uh, the, 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 um, the, the interview and yeah. make a physical item. I don't know. I think it's a great idea. I don't know if you, if you guys are into it, I'd love to do I'm it. Into that. All right. Awesome. We've got a wealth of knowledge between us alone right there to, to get something like going. So I think but Brooks will be the busy, busiest person. Well, I think <laughs> a lot of photos is like, ah, oh, I have to quit my job. I have to take all these photos. Well, honestly, I honestly, and, and I'm 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 very serious about this because I know it it takes money to to do this. But honestly, if there's if if, if like you want to hire a photographer and like like I would hire my friend to take my guitars, like not just like sitting on my floor, you know. I have a photographer um, home here. So but if no we want to take really nice photos of all the guitars and create like a bound book, I think that mm -hmm. would be absolutely amazing. Um, you have to, yeah. You have to agree on certain things like the the quality, the what exactly you're yeah, photographing, I mean, the, yeah. the information per guitar. Listen, it's not going to be like Simon and Schuster like and stuff, but it's going to, you know. I mean, well, it's a fan project, you know. Yeah, I, sure. I I'm in 100. percent No problem, money wise, whatever that's needed, I'll be in. Have any of you boys seen this book? I got this for Christmas two years ago. No, no. Who's in this? Oh, it's, it's a different uh, cover that we have. Yeah, I've seen a copy. Rock stars. And yeah. Phil is in here somewhere. Yeah. Phil, Phil, Phil. Chat amongst yourself because I'm blind. Well, they had that, you know, another idea was that because I went to Barnes & Noble the other night and they had the, the Jimmy Page anthology. 
and yeah, you know and, and seeing all these guitars that you guys have collectively um what an awesome keepsake that would be to have and you know what yeah. i take it back i would grab a, a supreme i just saw it hit phil supreme i was i would i think i would yeah. grab a supreme because it's got a floyd and it's got that monster now brooks knows this the two by phil neck i'll let brooks fill it in after that was the old slang from jackson his necks were two by fours two by fills so i would take a supreme but but you see i held i think you call it redneck yeah i held that yeah. as well it's, it's stupid thick the, the neck is <laughs> unplayable it's like, there you it's go stupid sorry it's stupid that's right up my alley and it, you funny you say that because as i handed him felix i was recording him playing felix so I, my wife hadn't come with that show he handed me redneck and I was like, this is it. And we did a little conference, <laughs> and I kid you not, stuff. You're they were, joking. even Phil was like, yeah, you're there, you're there. So my Felix is on par. And we were looking for a measure, a tape measure, literally pre-sound check. And John was like, do I have a tape measure? We we're trying to measure our necks, and we're just kind of eyeballing, and he's, yeah, you're, you've got it. Okay. So my then, Felix then. was redneck, and it's okay. absolutely, it's massive, it's top heavy, because it's not a massive a neck. And unplayable. So, for some people, Brooks, you haven't showed us the, um, the kind of mystery guitar that you required recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did absolutely. I'll show, I'll show that to you. So, um, back, this is the one I showed you guys before. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, went went around, and Phil played one of these on the uh, Let's Get Rock video, and I thought it was really cool. Well, in 2018, there was a a uh, sparkle that showed up on eBay and it was in Japan and there were people that were grabbing it and reposting it because what they do in Japan is once one store has it, a bunch of stores grab it. And then whoever gets the low bid will go to that store, buy it and sell it to that person. I personally, that's not the way I would prefer to make purchases, but that's kind of how it was going on. But what was unique was they were saying that it's serial number J six zero four four, which is one that I previously owned, but the guitar had EMGs, they said there's no serial number because Jackson screwed up. There was a lot of like, yeah, I don't know about this. So what I did was I actually went into the auction, and I'm just curious. I said, well, what's it going to take to actually get this thing shipped to the States? What if I roll the dice? Well, I went to the official website that's in Japanese, and of course, I can't read any of it. It's all black and uh, red and yellow and a lot of exclamation points, and I just can't read any of this stuff. So. I figured out where it says put in a shipping address, put in, you know, payment information just to see what's going to happen. And I did all that. And I got to one page that said, thank you for your order. It's the only thing in English. <laughs> I, what the hell did I, I what? So I just went, huh. So there she is. Whoa. So, so come to find out everything was legitimate. There is a letter right here from Jackson saying that they did screw up on the serial number. Um, it is from Sandra that worked at Jackson, 6044. Wow. Um, I still have the hang tag. Still have the warranty, copy of the warranty card that was sent in from the original guy. And it was originally with the MGs. Um, oh. So it, it literally was a USA art top. Um, and it has, you might not be able to see the difference, but it has yellowed over time, which only the USAs do. And, uh, yeah, so that was, a uh, that was a surprise and I've held on to it and haven't told anybody that I had it. That's that an amazing awesome. piece. Wow. But, yeah. It took, it took over a month to get it and I had no tracking information. I'm like, well, let's just see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Wow. That was the one. That's amazing. Thank you. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks for showing that. Well, guys, this is uh, this has been awesome uh, getting together and kind of really going deep into some of these guitars that I thought I had seen it all. I guess I hadn't. You guys are holding out on me. So thank you so much. We're going to post this um, you know, on YouTube for the PC1 community, and um, I think people mm -hmm. are really going to enjoy it. So thanks um, yeah. for taking the time to do it, and have a happy holiday. All right? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. Enjoy. Appreciate that. Take care, guys. All right, see, see you soon. Bye. Cheers. Whoa. Yeah, so as, as the set goes on, it's all programmed into the action packs. So I scroll through. Every song has got scenes. So every song's got a preset. 
fire it up to the rhythm, it goes to the chorus, it goes to the solo, animal. And you're, and you're doing all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he can just run around and, and show off. So like, you know, chorus, lead, all different sounds are programmed in there. So I have to, as I'm tuning over here, I'm hitting precepts here. And yeah. Backstage with Phil's guitars, the Sonics. Wow. Oh, that's the mocha with the with the splatter head stock. Okay, baby. Yes. Yep. Very a lot of boys. Bringing it back here. This is so awesome. He's just looking, he's gonna oh my god, the belly in real life. Yeah, yeah. Can I get a picture with? You want a I picture? I'll see you. Tomorrow, Adam Lee was bringing out some titanium blue socks for our saddles. Is Adam not here? here? He's coming tomorrow. Go ahead. This is amazing. Oh my God, I've never seen a neck like that. It's almost a beast. Yeah, it barely even fits in here. Okay, he's checking out all the guitars. I love the reverse. Oh, so he must have had another neck. Yeah, what happened was uh, there was a problem with the neck on this one. And Scotty stopped out years ago. They had a spare and he was flat on it. 